right. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris. I'm a third year graduate student at UC Riverside, and I'm going to talk about the implications of a short mean free path at redshift six for reionization. The mean free path is just the typical distance that an ionizing photon travels through the IgM before it's absorbed. And this is set by the opacity of the ionized gas in the IgM, as well as the distribution of the neutral gas. And in this figure, I've shown uh, the red lines indicate possible paths that an ionizing photon could take uh, during reionization. And as you can see, the mean free path evolves very quickly uh, during and after reionization. So the mean, direct measurements of the mean free path are a powerful probe of the reionization era. Now, recent work uh, has, has pointed towards uh, reionization finishing at redshift six or possibly even later. And these works have invoked late reionization to explain the large uh, opacity fluctuations in the Lyman Alpha forest that are observed below redshift six. And so measurements of the mean free path can also distinguish between these models because you expect different mean free paths uh, depending on how much neutral gas there is in the IgM. Now, until recently, measurements of the mean free path at redshifts grit, uh, less than 5.2, which I've shown here from Warsec et al. 2014, uh, have been consistent with existing re uh, reionization models. On this plot, I've shown two models uh, of, of the mean free path predicted by two theoretical models of reionization, one from Keating et al. 2020, in which reionization ends late at redshift 5.3, and one from DLOEC et al. 2020, in which uh, reionization ends at redshift 6. And as you can see, uh, both models are consistent with the existing measurements. Uh, now, the new measurements... Of the recently new measurements were published of the mean free path from Becker et al. 2021. And these measurements changed the story a little bit. So they the measure their measurement at redshift 5.1 is consistent with existing uh, measurements and theoretical predictions. But the measurement at redshift six, which I've highlighted here, is significantly shorter than predicted by a model of reionization that is 20% neutral at redshift six. So this presents a challenge for existing reionization models, and it's a challenge that we'll be addressing in this talk. Now, work has also been done to understand the impact of the ionized IgM on the mean free path. Uh, recently, Park et al. 2016 and DLOECO et al. 2020 ran very high-resolution simulations of the response of the IgM, to the ionized IgM to reionization, and they found a rather complicated picture. So as I've shown in this figure, uh, the IgM evolves from a highly clumpy state with a high recombination rate uh, with, for, with a very high recombination rate just after ionization. And over a time scale of a couple hundred million years, the IgM uh, goes to a much more diffuse uh, state with a lower recombination rate. And this process is driven by photoheating from reionization and takes place, again, it takes place over the, over the a time scale of a couple hundred million years, which is comparable to the time scale of reionization. So modeling these processes is also important for capturing the mean free path accurately. So to model reionization on large scales, we developed a new uh, ray tracing rate of transfer code. Uh, and post-process static density fields with ionizing radiation from halos with masses greater than 10 to the 9 solar masses. The this figure shows light cone slices through the density, the density and ionization fields on top and the photoionization rate fields on bottom from one of our simulations. And for each of these simulations, we set the global ionizing emissivity of our sources by hand uh, at each redshift to obtain the desired reionization history. And we've also developed a subgrid model for the impact of the ionizing photon sinks, the gas structures that set the recombination rate, uh, that are present on very small scales. We used a suite of 
HydroRT simulations with very high res spatial resolution, like those from DLOE CUL 2020, to capture the evolution of the ionizing photon opacity in environments with different photoionization rates, redshifts of reionization, and large scale overdensities. And what I've shown in this plot is that each one megaparsec over H cell in our large volume reionization simulation, pictured on the left, is effectively modeled by a simulation with kiloparsec scale resolution, a spatial resolution, which is pictured on the right. And in doing this, we achieve a formal dynamic range of over five orders of magnitude in spatial scale, while resolving all of the physics that's most important for setting the mean free path in ionized gas. Now on to our results. Uh, the first question, the first comparison we considered are two models of reionization, uh, one in which reionization proceeds rapidly in its latter half with a midpoint of redshift 5.1. And our gradual model, which has a midpoint of redshift 8.5 and proceeds more gradually in the latter half. Note that both models end reionization around redshift 5.1. So both of these are late reionization models. Uh, the left panel shows the ionization history for both models alongside constraints from the literature. And the right panel shows the emissivity history. Now, our main conclusion here is that the RAPID model does a better job of reproducing the quick evolution in the photoionization rate, which I've shown on the left, and the mean free path, which I've shown on the right here. Uh, notice that while the gradual model can reproduce the low redshift evolution of the mean free path very well, it misses the rapid evolution from Z equals six to low, towards lower redshifts, uh, and also undershoots the low redshift measurements of the photoionization rate by a factor of a few. The RAPID model agrees reasonably well with photoionization rate measurements and captures the quick evolution in the mean free path. And another uh, comparison we considered is uh, whether reionization is driven by faint or bright sources. Uh, the main difference between these models is that the fainter in the model that's driven by fainter sources, the sources are less clustered in space. They are less biased with respect to the underlying density field than in the bright sources model. Uh, note that both of these models have identical emissivity histories and almost exactly the same global ionization history. So I'm shown here. Our conclusion from this comparison is that reionization by faint galaxies reduces the mean free path at all redshifts compared to reionization by bright sources, particularly at redshift six. Um, this is for two reasons. One is that the less clustered sources result in smaller photoionization rates on average, which you can see on the in the left panel here. And at redshift six, when there's a significant amount of neutral gas in the IGM, the typical ionized bubble size is also smaller in the faint sources model. And this further reduces the mean free path at redshift six. Now, the last question we considered is whether the quick drop in emissivity in our rapid model, uh, which you can see in the black curve here on the right panel, is necessary to keep the photoionization rate and mean free path from outpacing the measurements at low redshift. So what we did here was we allowed the emissivity to go flat after redshift 6.5, and we added additional sinks to our, uh, to our model by changing the opacity in our subgrid model until we were able to fit the evolution of the mean free path measurements at low redshift. And we refer to this as our enhanced sinks model, which is shown here by the red curve. Our main conclusion here is that missing sinks, uh, adding additional sinks to our model can indeed regulate the photoionization rate and mean free path at the lowest redshifts. Um, notice that the mean free path here uh, on the right is in good agreement at all redshifts uh, with all the measurements at all redshifts. And the photoionization rate measurements also agree well uh, with, the, with the theory. So to put some numbers to this, uh, to get good agreement with the mean free path, we had to increase the opacity in overdense gas in our model by a factor of 1.3 and 2 at redshift 6 and 5.2, respectively. 
We also looked at the ionizing efficiency and escape fractions in our models. For our rapid models, uh, for reasonable values of the ionizing efficiency, we found escape. We found that our rapid models are consistent with escape fractions of 10 to 30 percent at redshifts greater than six, and this is consistent with previous work that has found that higher uh, that higher escape fractions are needed at these redshifts than what we see at lower redshifts in order to supply the photons needed to complete reionization. Uh, to put some additional numbers to this, the typical UV magnitude of the sources that drive reionization in our rapid model uh, is negative 12.9 and negative 14 at redshift six and eight, respectively. Our last result is the photon budget required to complete reionization. This plot, I've shown the number of photons per H atom uh, cumulative number of absorptions per H atom in each of our models with reionization again ending at redshift 5.1. We find that all of our models require about three photons per H atom to complete reionization, which is a factor of 1.5 to 2 more than has been found in many previous works. However, one caveat to all of our models is that the mean free path we predict is at, it intersects the upper one sigma error bar of the Becker et al. 21 uh, measurement at redshift 6 and has a neutral fraction of about 20%. Now, the recent work of Davies et al. 2021 found that if the central mean free path measurement uh, of uh, the central mean free path uh, measurement at redshift six and existing dark pixel constraints are both assumed, the number of photons required to complete reionization increases by a factor of two, which would put even more stringent demands on high redshift sources. I'll leave a conclusion slide here. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you, Chris. Looks like we have a couple of questions already. If you wanted to wait, maybe a little bit more, Steve. Sure, yeah, we'll wait 10 seconds or so, and then I'll ask the first question. So the first question is about the measurements. Um, they want to know how are measurements of the mean free path made, and then ask about why the uh, measurement at redshift six has a large error and whether that's due to cosmic variance. Uh, so very good question. So the mean free path is measured using uh, QSO absorption spectra um, by fitting the fitting the opacity uh, or fitting the flux profile to an opacity law. Um, and the re part of the reason for the large error bars at, uh, at redshift six is that the measurement the measurement is very hard to make, uh, in part because uh, the mean free path at that redshift is so short that there's a, qu a quasar proximity zone effect that you have to account for, and so part of the error comes from um, part of the error comes from uh, cor uh, correcting for that effect. Okay, uh, kind of a related question is a key ingredient of the short mean free path measurement is the proximity effect on scales larger than the mean free path. Uh, do you think that accounting for effects like the finite lifetime of QSOs and or clustering around QSOs could counteract the proximity uh, and increase the measurement of the mean free path length? That, that's, all, that's also a really good question. Um, I'll have to get back to you on that. I haven't... Uh, um, haven't looked at that in too much detail, but that's a very good question, and I will definitely get back to that. That's good. Another question: Does your recombination term explicitly include the clumping factor? If not, then that would naturally provide the sink boosting. Yes. So our, our uh, the way we the way we implement our subgrid model is by directly modeling the mean free path in the small scale uh, simulations, which includes which implicitly includes the clumping factor. Great. Uh, yeah, there are a few other questions that you can address by Slack, uh, but in the interest of time, we should we should move on now. Thank you very much again, Chris. Mm -hmm.